let's give Amanda a big round of applause for putting this together. So this has been a, a great journey for, for our center. And you know, remember, we, we draw our inspiration from you. Uh, we learn from you. We love taking care of patients and providing interdisciplinary care and, uh, and coordinating your care. And we learn what we need to be doing when we go back to the research lab from what you tell us. We don't dream it up, you know, it doesn't come to us magically, it comes to us through the interactions. And so all the innovations and all the great things of all the, the researchers here and the clinicians and the interdisciplinary team, they happen because of you. And so we're very appreciative of you and we believe that it's a partnership as we move forward uh, on this journey and we try to, to, uh, to, to push the horizon of Parkinson's disease and to bring a brighter day and, and a better day. And uh, you know, I, you may have noticed that I am not on the schedule to speak to you today. I know you're all tired of hearing me talk. Um, the reason I'm here today is because our guest speaker is one of the world's most famous Parkinson's experts, and he's one of our mentors. And frankly, you don't get the opportunity to see someone like him speak very often. So uh, I figured, you know, if, if someone like him is speaking in my hometown, I'm going to go see what he has to say. Um, he's just, uh, well, Michael's going to introduce him, but uh, the, the reason I'm here is to support, obviously, my colleagues and all of you, uh, but mainly to hear Dr. Jankovic. <laughs> hey. So a couple of housekeeping tips. There's a feedback form that uh, Amanda would like you to fill out. Remember, at the end of the day, there's also an Ask the Doctor session. We don't want anybody leaving here without their question answered. The entire staff is here this morning, and they're uh, among you. So feel free to grab people, ask questions. This is, uh, this is all about, uh, about interact interaction. There's a new Gainesville Young Onset Support Group meeting on the second Monday. And so if you're interested in that, uh, at uh, 6.30 is their meeting time. I hope that's 6.30 p.m. and not 6.30 a.m. And, uh, and Amanda will tell you about that. And after Dr. Jankovic's talk, we're gonna take questions immediately after that talk. So as your questions come up, I want you to scratch them on a, a piece of paper and raise your hand and we'll come get them during the talk and, uh, and we'll feed them to Dr. Jankovic and he'll answer as many questions as possible because he'll be leaving after his, uh, his talk this morning. So, uh, so with that, I would like to uh, welcome our, our guest speaker for the symposium. He is the, the Stockdale Endowed uh, Speaker as part of the Stockdale series. Uh, he has been here with us for several days. Uh, he has actually spent uh, the entire day yesterday with our fellows and our residents in training, teaching them about Parkinson's disease. He lectured for uh, five hours straight and uh, yesterday, which was amazing. He didn't even get up to go to the bathroom, which tells you what kind of, you know, like this guy's got a prostate of steel. And uh, it was unbelievable. Uh, and. But it's so important that we pass the tradition down, that we're training the next generation. And so part of the Stockdale Lecture Series is to educate our future. And so we brought all of our residents and all of our fellows in training. So there were, there were actually um, a 30 of them uh, that are all training to be grown-up neurologists and hopefully take care of the next generation of Parkinson's disease. Dr. Jankovic, um, I always uh, joke with him that there's no living person in Parkinson and movement disorders that's published more papers than Dr. Jankovic. And I always say, you gotta keep living, Joe, because you're, the tradition uh, continues to go. He's a young man and he continues to be the most productive and prolific person um, in the field. And, uh, and he has made uh, many important discoveries, been parts of, of many discoveries that span a wide range of topics, you know, from genetics to pathophysiology, to uh, attempts at cures and attempts at better symptomatic treatments to the development of better symptomatic treatments. Um, he trained at Columbia University in New York. Uh, he went to Houston, Texas to Baylor 
uh, over 30 years ago, and they had nothing when he came to Baylor, and now they're one of the world's finest groups, and they have the largest Parkinson support group in the country. It's called HAPS, and uh, and they're they're quite famous, and they raise a lot of money, and they have they put a lot of awareness into Parkinson disease. He's an amazing advocate. Um, he's been recognized with every major award uh, in the field, and with that, I'd like to to bring up Dr. Jankovic. And, Well, thank you, Michael and, and Kelly, for the most generous uh, introduction. Um, now that you learn about my bladder capacity, uh, you, you, you heard everything uh, there is to know about me. Then, um, so this is a real treat for me. Uh, I always enjoy talking to uh, patients. Uh, as Michael pointed out, I uh, come from uh, Houston, um, and uh, the Houston Area Parkinson Society is considered the mother of all support groups. Um, we have an annual meeting where we have about 500, 600 people uh, attending, and uh, uh, each year uh, they ask me to talk about different topics. But uh, last year, which was their 40th anniversary, uh, they asked me to cover the whole field. Uh, so I decided to come up with um, uh, a list of uh, 10 most frequently asked questions. <clears throat> Uh, that um, uh, patients ask me and uh, other physicians ask. And uh, what I hope to do is uh, address some of these uh, questions uh, with you. And in some cases, I'm going to be more detailed in other cases. But I'm going to uh, show a lot of slides. And I don't want you to be frustrated by not being able to understand or read every word from every slide. Uh, to be perfectly honest, the slides are more to remind me what I'm supposed to talk about uh, than necessarily for, for your benefit. But in, in each case, I'm going to try to highlight uh, some of the points that I hope uh, will be relevant uh, to you and uh, to your understanding of what Parkinson is all about and how we hope to treat it. Um, so uh, let me start. So these are the uh, 10 questions that I think are most frequently asked uh, by patients and uh, by other people interested in, in Parkinson's disease. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to try to address uh, these questions as we go along. Uh, uh, admitted Parkinson is the most uh, 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 common neurodegenerative disease. Uh, it affects about 1.5 million people uh, in the United States. 50,000 uh, 50, new cases are diagnosed every year. Uh, and uh, it's going to be the most uh, uh, common neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer um, uh, in the future. Uh, it's uh, a costly disease, not only in terms of human suffering, but also uh, financially it's uh, very costly. Uh, it's estimated that about $33 billion are spent on the care of uh, uh, people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, per patient, uh, it's estimated about, it costs about $22,800 per uh, year to, uh, uh, in medical expenses compared to people uh, who don't have Parkinson's disease who spend only $10,000 uh, uh, on their expenses. Um, obviously, support of Parkinson's disease-related uh, research is extremely critical for us to make advances in our understanding of Parkinson's disease and, and treatment. <clears throat> uh, the NIH uh, clearly plays an important role in this effort. Michael J. Fox Foundation is becoming uh, probably the number one organization to support Parkinson research. But National Parkinson Foundation um, is also playing an extremely important role. They raise about $10 million a year uh, for uh, Parkinson research and uh, other uh, Parkinson-related activities. So philanthropy is critical, obviously, to uh, for us to advance uh, the understanding of, of the disease. And uh, this is just one my pitch for those of you who are interested in Parkinson research and supporting Parkinson research. Please be as um, um, uh, generous as you can possibly be. So this is uh, uh, National Parkinson Foundation. They raise about $10 million a year. Uh, about 70% uh, of it uh, is directed to patient uh, care, research, and other uh, services. Uh, in fact, uh, your host, uh, Dr. Oaken, is the medical director uh, for the National Parkinson Foundation, and we are uh, a, a center of excellence. He's here pictured, uh, actually, in my office uh, with uh, Joyce Oberdorf, who is the president and CEO of National Parkinson Foundation. Uh, so we are very grateful to NPF uh, for their support. 
Okay, so how is Parkinson's disease diagnosed? Uh, um, we don't have a blood test uh, to make a diagnosis of Parkinson's. It's uh, based on uh, the history and observation of clinical features. Most of the motor features of Parkinson can be grouped under the, the four cardinal signs of Parkinson. Um, and we use the acronym TRAP uh, to uh, help us remember those four cardinal features. The tremor, rigidity, which means stiffness of muscles, akinesia, which refers to slowness of movement, and then partial instability, which basically refers to loss of balance. So these are the, uh, some of the motor features of, of Parkinson, but there are many, many other motor features of Parkinson. There are virtually dozens, if not hundreds, of motor features of Parkinson. More recently, just in the last 10 to 20 years, uh, many researchers have sort of shifted uh, their emphasis from these classic traditional motor features of Parkinson's disease to non-motor features of Parkinson, um, including behavioral, cognitive, sensory, autonomic type uh, problems like orthostatic uh, hypotension, low blood pressure, constipation, uh, urinary and sexual dysfunction, sleep disorders. These are also features of Parkinson's disease that really have not been fully recognized until the last uh, 10 uh, to 20 years. Years. Again, we don't have time to discuss all of those uh, features, but it's important to recognize uh, that Parkinson's disease is not just a motor disorder, but also uh, a, a disorder that has a variety of non-motor features that may uh, in many ways be more troublesome, more disabling uh, than uh, the, the motor features. And uh, maybe during the Q&A, we'll address some of those features uh, as we go along. Now again, as I pointed out, there's no diagnostic test for Parkinson's disease, but uh, we put together uh, these uh, 12 questions uh, that uh, we think are helpful in uh, 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 sort of establishing the diagnosis of, of Parkinson in patients who have never thought of having Parkinson. And we actually uh, uh, validated this questionnaire in our clinic and uh, the Michael J. Fox uh, Foundation decided to actually put it on their website. So if you are interested in uh, this uh, questionnaire uh, that we find as a useful screening tool uh, for the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, uh, you may get on the Michael J. Fox uh, website and uh, find uh, the, the questionnaire. Now, for a long time, uh, Parkinson's disease was thought to be a sort of a uniform disease. It was first described by James Parkinson in 1817 when he observed uh, three patients in his office and three other patients on the streets of London, and he described these classical features that I just uh, uh, noted for you. Uh, but uh, we have recognized over the last uh, several years that Parkinson's disease is not a uniform disease. Uh, there are many different subtypes of Parkinson's disease, and that's one of the things I've been interested in for a long time. And basically, uh, uh, about 20 years ago, we published a paper where we identified two major subtypes of Parkinson's disease. Uh, one is the tremor dominant form of Parkinson's disease, which represents about 75% of all patients with Parkinson, where uh, the initial symptom is tremor, the, the typical resting tremor, and then uh, the tremor evolves to, to other features of Parkinson's disease. And then the other type of Parkinson's disease that we refer to as PIGD, or partial instability gait difficulty form of Parkinson's disease, the PIGD form of Parkinson, which represents about 25% of patients with Parkinson. It turns out that those two subtypes uh, have a somewhat different natural history. They have a different progression. Uh, they are treated differently. Uh, for example, the tremor dominant form of Parkinson's disease tends to progress at a slow rate and is more responsive to medications than the PIGD form of Parkinson, which tend to progress more rapidly. Uh, patients with PIGD Parkinson are at a higher risk to develop a cognitive deficit and dementia, and they are more difficult to treat uh, than uh, uh, the patients with the tremor dominant form of Parkinson. Um, this is just a reference uh, from an article we published, uh, I think, last year. Um, uh, to uh, uh, describe those two uh, subtypes and then also describe other subtypes that uh, uh, I don't have time to discuss. Now, uh, again, getting back to uh, answer the question how we diagnose Parkinson's disease, um, uh, just over the last few years, uh, the, a new tool has been developed and approved by the FDA, uh, namely DATScan. So this is a special kind of scan that allows us to image uh, the dopamine system in the brain. 
I think all of you now know that uh, in Parkinson's disease there is a deficiency of dopamine. Uh, one way to treat uh, Parkinson would be to replace the dopamine with L-dopa. Uh, but we also uh, take this knowledge to uh, uh, develop tools that uh, allows us to image the dopamine system in the brain. And this DAD scan, which was approved uh, by the FDA a few years ago, uh, helps us differentiate, uh, for example, normal uh, 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 dopamine system compared to abnormal dopamine system. So you can see here in a normal brain, uh, you see this uh, 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 normal density of the dopamine transporter, whereas here uh, uh, in patients with Parkinson's disease, there's a marked deficiency of the dopamine transporter. So this is a useful tool, uh, uh, particularly in, in patients who are in very early stages of Parkinson's disease, in whom we are not 100% sure they really have for Parkinson. Uh, and also, it helps us differentiate Parkinson's disease from uh, this other condition called essential tremor. Uh, those two conditions are frequently misdiagnosed, and, and even experienced neurologists sometimes have trouble differentiating essential tremor, uh, which is a much more benign condition, manifested mainly by tremor, from Parkinson's disease. Disease. So this scan, the DAD scan, allows us to differentiate uh, those two conditions, essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. We have been working on uh, other kinds of uh, uh, imaging, and this is from a paper we published recently uh, on the future re of research in Parkinson's disease, where we show this new uh, imaging uh, that we think is even better than the DAD scan, again, showing the normal uh, density of the dopamine system uh, in uh, a healthy individual. And here in a patient with Parkinson's disease, you can see the marked uh, deficiency of uh, the dopamine system. So these are some of the tools that we are beginning to use to help us uh, confirm the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, but we still don't have uh, a specific diagnostic test uh, to uh, uh, establish the diagnosis. Now, there are a number of what's called biomarkers that are currently being tested to see if those biomarkers can also help us uh, with the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And I'm not going to go into uh, a great deal of uh, discussion about biomarkers, but I just want to draw attention uh, to this study called PPMI. How many of you have heard of PPMI? Okay, so uh, uh, this is actually a very important study uh, funded through the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Uh, we participate in it uh, where we take uh, individuals in very early stages of Parkinson's disease uh, and then follow them for at least five years, and then we test their blood, their spinal fluid, uh, their genes, uh, their, do brain scans, do all these diagnostic tests uh, to see if we can find certain uh, markers like certain proteins like, for example, alpha-synuclein that you may have heard about, uh, certain genetic abnormalities, uh, and a number of other markers uh, that uh, may help us establish uh, the diagnosis early, even perhaps before the onset of, of symptoms. So having a diagnostic test that will identify individuals from a general population who are at risk for developing Parkinson's disease would be an extremely important advance. Because if we eventually are gonna develop neuroprotective therapy, therapy that will slow down the progression of the disease, this is the population uh, that we wanna target. Uh, the population that does not have the full syndrome of Parkinson's disease, but is just beginning to develop symptoms or maybe even just at risk for developing Parkinson before they develop symptoms. So this is the whole purpose for the biomarkers, the PPMI study. Uh, uh, we're looking, uh, uh, for example, at genes like a LARC2 gene, which is one of the more common genes that can cause Parkinson's disease. REM behavioral disorder uh, is a sleep disorder that uh, I'm sure many of you have experienced where you act out your dreams during sleep. Uh, it turns out that this is a risk factor for Parkinson. So many people with Parkinson have RBD, REM behavioral disorder, several years or even decades before they develop symptoms. So we think that this is an important biomarker for Parkinson's disease. Uh, olfaction deficit, uh, this has been well recognized that people with Parkinson often lose smell even years or decades um, uh, before the onset of symptoms. So the, this, these are just examples of some of the biomarkers that uh, the PPMI is looking at. So for every patient that I diagnose in my clinic, I recognize that there are hundreds of individuals walking around perfectly normal who uh, have not yet developed Parkinson, 
but are at risk for developing Parkinson. And as I pointed out, uh, it would be wonderful to be able to identif identify those individuals. So the diagnosis uh, of Parkinson really represents just the tip of the iceberg, uh, uh, because under the uh, iceberg there are many conditions that have not yet fully developed into a full Parkinson uh, disease. Uh, so we talked about gene mutations, for example. So there are individuals who have gene mutations uh, but don't have Parkinson disease yet. But as you follow them, uh, they may develop Parkinson. Uh, we talked about essential tremor, and even though I pointed out it's a different disease from Parkinson's disease, it turns out that a subset of patients with essential tremor actually do develop uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, then there are these non-motor features. We talked about anosmia, which means loss of smell, constipation. There are many, many, many features uh, uh, of Parkinson uh, that may be manifested even before uh, we establish the diagnosis or before the patients begin to develop motor symptoms. And that's one of the main areas of research currently is to identify these biomarkers. And I pointed out about PPMI, but there are many other uh, studies that are looking at that. Okay, what causes Parkinson's disease? If I knew that, I would get a Nobel Prize, but um, th there have been uh, many, many attempts to understand what is the mechanism of cell death uh, that results in the dopamine deficiency. So, uh, again, I don't have time to go into this in any detail, but the bottom line is that, that most of us who are involved in Parkinson's research, research believe that there is a complex interaction between genetic factors and environmental factors, which then results in uh, gradual uh, loss of neurons uh, in the part of the brain called the substantia nigra, which is the part of the brain that uh, contains these dopamine-producing neurons. And as a result of the death of these nigral neurons, the patients with Parkinson develop dopamine deficiency. How that happens uh, is obviously something that we are intensely interested in and researching. So if you examine the brain of a patient with Parkinson's disease, you see two major pathological hallmarks. One is uh, uh, the loss of uh, the pigment uh, in this part of the brain called the substantia nigra. So the reason why it's called nigra, it, the word nigra means black. And the reason uh, why uh, this uh, part of the brain called the midbrain, uh, this uh, uh, part of the brain is black or uh, substantia nigra is because these dopamine producing cells also produce a pigment called melanin, which makes this area uh, black. So here you see the normal uh, midbrain, here you see the midbrain of a patient with Parkinson's disease, uh, and there is a depigmentation of the substantia nigra. So this is one of the classic pathological hallmarks of Parkinson's disease. Uh, the other pathological hallmark is something that you cannot see with your naked eye, but you have to look, use a microscope, and that's called Lewy body. Uh, and you're going to hear a lot about Lewy bodies uh, uh, as you read uh, about Parkinson's disease, maybe even perhaps during the course of the day. Uh, so this is a, a, a histological hallmark of Parkinson's disease that you can see under microscope. So in order to make a definite diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, one has to have these pathological criteria. Uh, of course, it's already too late. Uh, you obviously want to make the diagnosis long before you examine the brain. So again, in Parkinson's disease, so there's a depigmentation of the substantia nigra. We see these Lewy bodies. And the other uh, uh, feature of uh, the Parkinson brain is that there is an accumulation of this protein called alpha-synuclein. How many of you heard of alpha-synuclein? OK, some of you have. This is an important uh, uh, protein to uh, remember uh, because it's a protein that accumulates and aggre aggregates in the brains of patients with Parkinson's disease and causes damage. It's a toxic protein. And it not only causes uh, damage in the area where it accumulates, but actually uh, it transmits from one cell to another. In fact, the most recent uh, understanding of Parkinson's disease is that the Parkinson's disease may not actually start in the brain, but may start actually in the gut, it may start in your heart, it may start somewhere outside of the brain, and then this protein, this alpha-synuclein, which accumulates in the gut or in the heart and other uh, parts of your body, then is transmitted into the brain 
uh, and then it causes damage in the brain, initially in the lower part of the brain, and then uh, it uh, ascends to the uh, upper part of the brain, uh, the brainstem, and uh, the rest of the brain. So it sort of spreads um, uh, in, a, in a way that uh, really has not been fully recognized until just in the last few years. So this is a very important observation. So one of the things that we obviously would like to do is to get rid of the alpha synuclein protein, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it, uh, how, uh, uh, what kind of strategies are being used to uh, get rid of this alpha synuclein. So uh, what, uh, what else can we do uh, to uh, sort of um, uh, slow down the progression of, of the disease other than getting rid of the alpha synuclein before it accumulates? There are a number of studies that have looked at this. Uh, and, uh, for example, neuroprotective type uh, factors uh, has been found, for example, people who smoke uh, uh, have a low risk of Parkinson. That is not a suggestion that you should start smoking. Um, and caffeine also uh, has been shown to be associated with a low risk of Parkinson, which is one reason why I have about four or five cups of coffee a day. Uh, uh, another uh, uh, factor that appears to uh, slow down or prevent the progression of, of Parkinson is exercise. Many, many animal and human studies have shown that uh, exercise prevents or slows uh, progression of Parkinson's disease. So what is the natural history of Parkinson's disease? Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, we talked about uh, these symptoms uh, that uh, may occur even before uh, uh, the typical motor symptoms of Parkinson, the loss of smell, constipation, uh, and so on. Uh, this is the preclinical stage, and then uh, there is an early stage, and then there is a more advanced stage. So there's, uh, again, the accumulation of this protein, alpha synuclein, which then causes dysfunction of the uh, nerve cells and eventual cell death. So we, we would like to intervene, obviously, as early as possible, in the, even in the preclinical stage, to see if we can uh, slow down the progression of the disease. So um, this is sort of the natural history of, of Parkinson's disease. There are genetic environmental factors that uh, result in the loss of uh, neurons, like in the uh, olfactory neurons where that mediates your smell, uh, or other uh, uh, areas before patients begin to develop uh, uh, motor symptoms. Uh, then uh, many patients, of course, are starting on some therapy. Uh, in many cases, L-DOPA is the treatment uh, that is uh, used in, in, in initial treatment. The patients then uh, improve and uh, they, uh, their symptoms often get much better. They may even melt away, they resolve, and uh, we call this the honeymoon uh, period. But unfortunately, like many honeymoons, uh, this honeymoon doesn't last forever. Um, and uh, patients begin to develop problems. Uh, they develop levodopa-related uh, complications. So uh, what we do in the clinic, what uh, Michael and I and, uh, and other Parkinsonologists do in the clinic, we don't necessarily treat Parkinson's disease. We treat the complications of levodopa therapy. That's what we do most of the time. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and then, uh, in addition to the motor symptoms, which fortunately do respond quite well to levodopa, patients begin to develop these non-motor symptoms like cognitive decline, dementia, uh, we talked about the autonomic symptoms and a number of other symptoms that unfortunately don't respond well to uh, dopaminergic therapy, and that is the major challenge in the treatment of Parkinson's disease, is not necessarily to treat these cardinal motor symptoms, but to treat the non-motor symptoms and the, motor, and the motor symptoms that don't respond to levodopa, and eventually the patients may die as a result of complications. So how can Parkinson's disease be prevented or slowed? How many of you know who Sergey Brin is? Okay, <laughs> uh, our AV guy knows who Sergey Brin is. Um, uh, but Sergey Brin is one of the most famous uh, people in the world uh, because he's a co-founder of Google. Uh, he's also one of the wealthiest pe people. I think he's ranked in top 10 of the wealthiest people in the world. Um, and he happens to have a gene mutation that has a high risk for developing Parkinson's disease. It's called LARC2 mutation. So here's an individual who is perfectly healthy. He's in his 30s. Um, and uh, he knows that he has a very high risk for developing Parkinson's disease. So what did he do to find out what he can do to prevent the development of Parkinson's disease? Well, he obviously Googled everything he could. Uh, 
and he came up with a conclusion uh, based on his Google search uh, that the most important thing you can do is to exercise. And he, in fact, uh, uh, started uh, a very aggressive exercise program. He's a swimmer and diver, uh, and he felt that that was the best way he can prevent the progression of Parkinson's disease. Um, so I, I had an uh, honor to meet him and meet his mother uh, here, who actually all, already has Parkinson's disease, and she's the one who passed on the gene from uh, uh, her to her to him and to to his brother. Um, so. Uh, uh, I'm just pointing out, so here's a, probably one of the smartest people in the world, um, and based on uh, access to the, all the information available to him, he concluded that exercise is the most important thing he can do uh, to prevent uh, the development of Parkinson's disease. So this is just a slide, again, I don't expect you to read it, uh, but it reminds me uh, to talk about the importance of exercise. I think all of you are very familiar with it, and uh, your neurologist, I'm sure, talks to you about the importance of exercise. Uh, but there are many uh, very well-designed scientific studies that have clearly proven uh, that exercise does do some good. So this is not just somebody telling you you should exercise. There is actually scientific evidence to prove that exercise not only uh, helps you uh, in terms of your condition, your cardiovascular uh, system, but there is actually a, a way that exercise can uh, build up trophic factors in the brains and may actually slow down the Parkinson's disease through this uh, biochemical trophic mechanism. Um, now, uh, until quite recently, most uh, patients were advised to, to go for a walk or swim and the, the usual kind of exercise programs. But there's new science that clearly indicates that short, high-intensity exercise is more beneficial than you taking two or three-hour uh, walk. And uh, there's a lot of evidence for that, and I just want to emphasize that, that point. Uh, this is just one study that was recent, recently uh, published uh, that uh, talked about the importance of high-intensity exercise. Tai Chi uh, is another, uh, uh, f uh, it's not a really form of exercise, but it's, a, I guess, a relaxation technique that, a technique that has been also shown scientifically uh, to be beneficial in patients with Parkinson's disease. What can we do pharmacologically with medications? So um, one of the uh, problems in Parkinson's disease is there is too much uh, oxidation going on in the brains, uh, which uh, then cause further toxicity. So they, therefore, antioxidants have been tested uh, to see if we can slow down the Parkinson's disease in animal models and then uh, in humans. There are two antioxidants that are currently available. Uh, one is the Depranil, the other one is uh, Rosagiline. Um, these are uh, drugs that we sometimes use in early stages of Parkinson's disease to see uh, if we can use them as antioxidants in order to uh, slow down the prog progression of disease. There are many other uh, mechanisms that these drugs have um, besides serving as antioxidants. Um, so, uh, for example, rasagiline, which has been t uh, studied uh, very intensely, has been shown that uh, 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 if introduced early, it can delay the need for, uh, for levodopa. And this is from uh, a study called Adagio study, which uh, was published in New England Journal of Medicine. It's a very uh, famous uh, study. Uh, we were fortunate to participate in that study. And what we showed here is that uh, 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 in the group of patients that was assigned to early star treatment with rosagiline one milligram, there was a reduction in the motor score. We call it UPDRS. This is a clinical rating scale that we use. So there was a significant reduction uh, in the score because of the symptomatic benefit. Uh, but then uh, uh, the patients continued to progress. Uh, the, the patients who were assigned to delayed start, who were initially treated with placebo, uh, they had a much more rapid progression. And after 72 weeks, you can see that those patients who started rosagiline early had a less, less disability uh, than those patients who um, uh, were uh, in, uh, in whom uh, uh, the, the medication was delayed. My pointer is not working anymore. Uh, is, is there anyone who can help me? No, no pointer. Okay, I'll just try to describe the, uh, uh, the slides. So um, 
Rasagelin, um, uh, of course, uh, because of this observation, was thought to be a drug that could possibly um, actually slow down the progression of the disease. But when we apply to the FDA uh, for uh, indication to give us an approval to uh, uh, sort of develop rasagelin as a disease modifying therapy, FDA just didn't think there was enough data to approve the drug uh, for that purpose. So currently, rasagelin is not approved as a disease modifying therapy, but I think there's very solid evidence that it does delay the need for levodopa. Um, so what are the best available medications to treat Parkinson's disease? Well, we just talked about rasagelin, and we talked about uh, its potential for slowing down the progression of the disease. But it also provides symptomatic benefit. So many of you who were starting rosagelin early on may have noticed some improvement in your tremor, or slowness of movement, or other symptoms that, that you have. And you know, the improvement may not be very robust, but probably is enough to provide at least mild symptomatic benefit and it justifies the use of rosagelin, I think, in early stages of Parkinson patients who have relatively mild uh, Parkinson. But it turns out that rasagelin, uh, and this is from a study we just published where we showed that, that those patients treated with rasagelin had a significant reduction in all these various motor symptoms, tremors, slowness of movement, rigidity, and so on. Now, rasagelin also has been shown to be useful not only in patients in early stages of Parkinson, but also uh, uh, in patients who are already treated with levodopa. Uh, and here from one of the studies that we participate, participated, we showed that uh, when, if we uh, use rasagelin, uh, we can significantly reduce the off time. So the patients with Parkinson who take levodopa and fluctuate, who have the on time and the off time, when we add rasagelin to L-dopa, we can significantly reduce uh, the off time. And another study conducted in Europe uh, showed a very similar result. So rasagelin is not only helpful in early stages of Parkinson's disease, but also in uh, patients treated with levodopa who have motor fluctuations. So uh, how do we treat Parkinson? Well, we talked about um, uh, MAO inhibitors um, um, uh, such as uh, dep uh, Deprene or Rasagelin. Uh, in addition, there are other uh, uh, medications that are used. We know that we cannot use dopamine uh, as a treatment, even though we know dopamine is deficient in Parkinson's disease because dopamine doesn't get uh, across the blood-brain barrier. Uh, so we use levodopa, which is a precursor of dopamine. Uh, and it readily crosses the blood-brain barrier and it is then converted to dopamine in the brain. So how do we enhance the L-DOPA treatment? Well, one way would be to block the metabolism of L-DOPA uh, in, the, in the periphery. So L-DOPA is converted to dopamine and uh, thiomethyl dopa. If we block the metabolism of uh, L-DOPA by using dopa decarboxylase inhibitors, COMT inhibitors, you don't need to remember any of this, but these are drugs that are often combined with levodopa in order to improve uh, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, transmission of the levodopa into the brain. So we don't use it, you know, we don't prescribe it levodopa. All of you who are taking levodopa almost always are taking levodopa with carbidopa, the carbidopa levodopa combination, often referred to as cinnamon, or you may also uh, have it uh, combined with catechol or methyl transferase inhibitor like entacopone in a form of stelivo. So those are the combinations that uh, uh, most people use, levodopa, carbidopa, levodopa, carbidopa, entacopone combinations. Uh, so the, that is one way that we can enhance the effects of, of levodopa. In, in the brain, uh, if we block uh, these uh, 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 enzymes that metabolize dopamine, like using selagenine or uh, one can also improve the dopamine transmission. We can also completely bypass this dopamine synthesizing step and stimulate the dopamine receptors directly using a, a class of drugs called dopamine agonists. Examples of that would be Pramipexol, Ropinorol, uh, uh, Nupro, or Roticotin. Uh, these are the, the drugs that we, we most frequently use as dopamine agonists to stimulate the dopamine uh, receptors. 
Now, despite all our efforts, many patients uh, gradually develop what's called motor fluctuations. So instead of having uh, six to eight hours of benefit at the beginning of uh, the treatment, uh, the benefit gradually shortens, and some, some patients derive only one or two hours of benefit after each dose of levodopa, uh, and that's uh, uh, called wearing off effect. And many patients, in addition to shortening of their levodopa response, they develop abnormal involuntary movements called dyskinesias. And all of you, I think, are familiar with that. So this is uh, uh, what I tried to illustrate on this slide, is that the therapeutic window gradually narrows, and after several years of treatment, uh, patients either are on, and when they are on, they have dyskinesias, the abnormal involuntary movements, or they are off and have trouble arising from a chair, have trouble walking, and that is what we deal with in, uh, in our Parkinson clinic. Patients who have these motor fluctuations, they have the choice to be either on with dyskinesias or off and unable to uh, move. So um, uh, we have tried to, to address the question, how do we uh, improve that? It turns out that uh, uh, L-DOPA, even though it is clearly the most effective treatment we have for Parkinson's disease, does have these complications in terms of the motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. And in one of the studies, uh, we showed that 16.5% of patients taking 600 milligrams of levodopa develop dyskinesias after only about 40 weeks of treatment. So even after a relatively short period of treatment, uh, less than a year, 16% already uh, had dyskinesia in this study where we followed the patients very carefully from the time we initiated levodopa therapy. So I just want to show you an example of somebody with dyskinesia. Uh, uh, this is a, a classic uh, sort of a, a stereotypic type uh, involuntary movement uh, that patients with dyskinesia have. And there are many d examples of, the, of that. Um, now, let me show you another example. This is a patient who uh, called me a week after I increased her cinnamon, and she said, you know, my tremor is worse, and uh, it just didn't make any sense. Cinnamon improves tremor, it doesn't make it worse. So I had her come in the clinic, and this is the woman that she has. So to her, it looked like she had increased tremor, but to me, she had dyskinesia. Okay, and I'm using as an example how important it is to make these observations and you need to really describe uh, to your neurologist exactly what's happening. Preferably even take a video uh, with your iPhone and send it to him or have the patient uh, have actually the neurologist examine you uh, so you can look at this and say, oh, this is not increased tremor, this is dyskinesia. So what are the best strategies to treat and prevent levodopa-related com complications? Um, well, first of all, we, we know what the risk factors are. Uh, the higher the dose, the longer the duration of treatment with levodopa, those are the risk factors. We also know that young onset Parkinson patients are at a much higher risk. So the younger the age of onset, the higher the risk for these motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. We know that there are certain genetic forms of Parkinson's disease that increase the risk of uh, these fluctuations. So in those individuals uh, in whom we know uh, uh, that there is a high risk for these motor fluctuations, we have to be extra careful. We try to delay the onset of levodopa therapy and use the smallest possible dosages. Um, so uh, uh, there are now new treatments that have been developed, and I just want to uh, say a few things about uh, those treatments that are specifically designed uh, to uh, prolong uh, uh, the response to levodopa. One of them is uh, a drug called Ritari. How many of you have heard of Ritari? Okay, actually, relatively few. Um, uh, th th this is one of the more frequently asked questions. Uh, when are you going to put me on Ritari? Because this is a drug that was approved um, uh, recently by FDA. It's a different formulation of levodopa that has a longer duration of, of action um, and uh, could be um, very um, uh, effective in uh, patients who have these motor fluctuations. Um, and uh, uh, th this is from a study we re recently published showing that patients on Ritari have a longer response to levodopa, they have less off time. Um, uh, we talked about entacopone, uh, which is uh, in a form of Stalivo, uh, that also prolongs the response to levodopa, uh, and most of you are familiar with that. 
Uh, and then dopamine agonists, uh, like I mentioned uh, already, uh, uh, Pramipexol, Ropinorol, and uh, Roticotine, uh, these drugs also prolong uh, the response to levod uh, le levodopa, but many of them have potential side effects, um, and one of the side effects, uh, for example, of uh, these drugs is that uh, cause, they cause edema, they cause psychiatric, edema means ankle swelling, uh, psychiatric side effects, uh, sleepiness, in this study, we showed that uh, although patients who were initially treated with Promipexol had lower frequency of wearing off effect and dyskinesia, they had a higher uh, frequency of edema and uh, sleepiness, so you always have to weigh the uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, uh, th there are new dopamine agonists that have a longer duration of action, uh, like the Ropinorol uh, XL and Promiplexol ER, and then Rotigotine, which is a patch that can, uh, that, uh, can uh, be used to administer uh, the um, uh, dopamine agonist continuously. Um, there's uh, um, uh, new d treatments uh, uh, that uh, also are being developed, and you're going to be hearing about Duopa, uh, which is another treatment that has been recently approved uh, in, uh, for patients who have motor fluctuations in order to prolong the response to, to levodopa. So these are some of the side effects of dopamine agonists, uh, uh, including uh, low blood pressure, headaches, dr drowsiness, uh, increased uh, dyskinesia, and, and some uh, other side effects. The older dopamine agonists like pergolide and bromocryptine have a much higher risk of these complications and we rarely ever use those. One of the most fierce side effects is uh, ICD, impulse control disorder, including uh, increased gambling, uh, uh, compulsive shopping, uh, and uh, hypersexuality. Uh, this is one of the, uh, my patients that uh, developed um, uh, this compulsion to collect uh, certain objects like axes and, uh, um, and pipes, so their house is all filled uh, with these. Uh, this is a letter from uh, his wife, so he has growing fascination with collecting objects, uh, a behavior that seems to have blossomed since he began dopaminergic medication. Examples include a, a collection of these um, uh, axes. One patient uh, developed hobbyism. He was never interested in uh, Indian culture, but for some reason, uh, when he was placed on Levadopa, uh, he began to be interested in American native Indian culture uh, and started to make uh, bows and arrows uh, out of nowhere, so uh, just a new hobby. Uh, in some cases, Parkinson patients actually develop new creativity, and we talked yesterday uh, with Michael and others about how Parkinson patients found new talents uh, when they uh, are treated with uh, medications. Uh, they become artists, and uh, uh, those of you who have been to, to the clinic uh, have seen the art uh, that his Parkinson patients donated, uh, uh, partly as a re uh, result of creativity. I'm going to stop here because uh, this was going to introduce the topic of DOPA, but I just found out this morning that you have a separate talk on DOPA, uh, so uh, I'm not going to say much more about that and just want to allow enough time uh, for Q&A. So thank you very much. I didn't have time to talk about experimental therapeutics and what's in the future, uh, but uh, I think you are mostly interested in knowing what is available right now, and uh, I'm sure that uh, sometime in the future uh, we'll have an opportunity to talk about experimental therapeutics. Uh, uh, I will bring my crystal ball next time and uh, look into the crystal ball and tell you what's in the future. But uh, thank you very much for your attention.